Luke, uh, today we're going to study the first nine verses of Luke chapter 12, 13. So please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. We're in a portion of the gospel in which the Lord, uh, it seems, uh, is noticeably raising the temperature in his discourse and in his interactions with all this crowd, this multitude that's following him. In our previous study, you'll recall, we, uh, it, which dealt with the final verses of chapter 12, I described then what we called an increase in intensity and the drama of the moment. One sensed a sudden shift to a more challenging uh, tone with Jesus describing a very serious uh, judicial setting with the verdict uh, turning uh, not to acquittal, uh, but to something akin to capital punishment, paying the very last cent, Jesus said, of the punishment uh, due. A, a clear allusion, I believe, to the threat of being cast into hell. Uh, that tone continues. Uh, now there is a threat of perishing, uh, the image of a figurative fig tree uh, being cut down by its displeased owner. Uh, these figures combined to represent a warning to his hearers that they had uh, better take the proper measures to ensure their own continued well-being uh, while they have opportunity. So Luke writes uh, in verse 1 of chapter 13, now on the same occasion, so this is just continuing where we were, uh, he's Continuing in some sense the same theme, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? You'll notice he repeats the same thing in verse five. I tell you, no, that unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he began telling this parable. It feels so like uh, what we're familiar with uh, in reading the Gospels, uh, Jesus interacting, and then suddenly he mixes in a parable with, with his instructions. So Luke says, and he began telling this parable. A, a man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, uh, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer and if it bears fruit next year, now you can see uh, the next word in your text, whatever version you have is in italics because it's not in the original Greek. It's, and if it bears fruit next year, it, it's like a tone of resignation, I think. If it bears fruit next year, so be it, fine. But if not, cut it down. It is a dangerous delusion uh, to think that because you seem to be passing through life unscathed by special tragedy that you are somehow uh, right uh, with God. That's not the case at all. And the Lord was at pains at every turn to inform the people of Israel that if they had been spared the type of divine discipline they deserve, one day God's patience with them will be spent. Though the Jewish people in Jesus' day were living uh, 
as the subjects of a foreign occupier, Rome, uh, which could be quite merciless if their laws uh, were violated, the majority of the population were still able to live somewhat normal lives, uh, pursuing occupations, uh, forming and raising uh, families and enjoying many of the fruits of lives lived responsibly. As Jesus made his way among them, he met up with people of uh, every persuasion and every circumstance. Undergirding our passage this morning, however, is the very biblical truth that all have sinned, what the Apostle Paul would later write about in Romans uh, chapter 3. Every person must bear the guilt of their sin, and so God requires from each person individually uh, that they repent, that they stop uh, proceeding in their natural direction of thinking and of life and turn and proceed in God's way, yielding to Him in faith and allowing the one whom God has appointed, in the case of our fig tree parable, the vineyard keeper, allowing him to loosen and separate them from their sin and, and live so that they might bear fruit. So now here's the structure of our passage. Uh, first, there is tragedy. Then uh, the people's faulty reasoning kicks in. Uh, those unaffected by the tragedy think themselves superior because it has not happened to them. Uh, coming out of that response is Jesus' correction of their reasoning. And then at the end, the two possible outcomes of the parable. Uh, some will die, uh, some will live and bear fruit. As is the case uh, virtually at any moment in a person's life, uh, the world about continues to spin. And somewhere not too far from any of us, uh, tragedies occur. Good things happen uh, too. Uh, uh, people live and work. Uh, society uh, functions. Families uh, grow and expand. Uh, but the humdrum of daily life persists for long, without, it, it never persists for long without some event occurring that proves to be remarkable in some way or another, and often it is tragic. If that tragic thing hits close to home, uh, we mourn uh, deeply and our lives are changed. But if we're removed from the tragedy, we take note, uh, commiserate perhaps, and generally move on with our lives, uh, filing away those more unconnected goings on under the category of something like current events. Uh, in the passage, Luke provides now some of those who had been following along with Jesus on the way bring up uh, one of those current events. Uh, Luke tells us it involves some Galileans whose blood uh, Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. We don't get the feeling the tragedy was particularly personal uh, to those who approached Jesus. It was just remarkable on its face. Uh, Pilate had a reputation for cruelty. Galileans had a reputation for rebelliousness. Uh, the incident could have occurred at Passover time, the only time when Israelites uh, not of the priesthood, sacrifice their own animals. And so the news was spreading that a certain company of faithful Galileans had come into Jerusalem uh, to sacrifice for the festival. Uh, Pilate likely construed their activities as sedition, and they had been put to death by the governor's forces while they were engaged in worship, in, in making their sacrifices. And thus it could be said that Pilate had mixed Galilean blood with their sacrifices. There's nothing in our history books, you know, as teachers, we comb the commentators and the, the books. There's nothing in our uh, history books that describe an incident like this, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Uh, everybody in Luke's narrative, it seems, were understood to be aware of it. It was a current event, something that truly had happened and it was worth commenting on. 
The same could be said of the incident Jesus proceeds to reference in verse 4. Uh, 18 people on whom uh, the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Uh, Siloam was the name of a reservoir uh, east-southeast of the city of Jerusalem, which was one of the principal sources of water uh, supplied to the city. Uh, the pool uh, figures here and there uh, in the Bible as a staple of the city's features. Uh, the tower, uh, named after Siloam, was probably sited on a ridge above the pool, and as can uh, happen when man-made structures are erected on earthworks, uh, time had likely worked its erosive effects and the tower had fallen, uh, killing a good number of people who had the misfortune of being nearby when it collapsed. Uh, that sounds uh, horrible, especially if you were one of them or you were uh, close to one of them, intimately connected with them. But as one of the commentators observed, it was an incident too trifling to appear in a history book, and so we know, have no recorded history of that tragedy uh, either. The world today, uh, it is uh, argued, is much more sinful and prone to tragedy than previous generations, whether that's true or not. We have no shortage uh, weekly, sometimes uh, it seems daily of these kinds of current events that uh, capture our attention, if only uh, for a moment. What, what could be more wholesome and enjoyable than uh, a Super Bowl uh, parade and, and celebration, especially when your team, like in this case, won? Uh, but most of this week were, were startled, dismayed, uh, generally crestfallen to see the videos of these shots uh, ringing out and the people scrambling in panic at the parade's end. Someone was killed, children were injured, uh, joy and laughter turned to tears and dismay. We saw it, I suspect almost everyone in this room saw uh, the news. In another place, a sudden avalanche uh, raged down a mountain and buried an entire family. And the list goes on. None, however, of these will survive most of our memories long enough to be communicated to our grandchildren. Why do bad things happen to good uh, people? That's a most popular question that all of us understand uh, to some degree. Uh, books have been written addressing it, but it's a tricky one. It's a tricky question. Uh, the people of Israel following after Jesus this day would not have necessarily agreed that these bad things had happened to good uh, people. On the contrary, it was common at the time uh, when seemingly unexplainable tragedies such as these occurred for people to seek to find some character flaw or particular sin that seemed to have been behind their misfortune. The most expressive illustration of that way of thinking, you're probably thinking of it already with me, is found in the account of the man blind from birth that John gives us in John chapter uh, 9. And you know the story as Jesus and his disciples were uh, traveling along away from the temple precincts. They saw this man on the side of the road probably begging uh, a pitiful and, and sad sight, and it caught their attention so much so that his disciples questioned Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? It was a perfect teaching moment for uh, the Lord to take on this popular belief that any misfortune in life must have its cause in the sin or sins of one or another uh, person. Uh, the disciples would have known that the scriptures did often associate suffering uh, with sin. Uh, but the scriptures also give frequent illustrations of human suffering that cannot be attributed to one's sin. Job is the primary example probably in uh, the Bible. Uh, all suffering in the first place can rightfully be attributed 
uh, to sin, not necessarily a particular sinful deed that one has done, but just sin in general. Uh, the creation groans, uh, weeds sprout, uh, lightning strikes. It wasn't that way before sin entered the world. But it's also true that some suffer because of their own sin. Uh, either it is the direct consequence of what one has done or one's behavior or the Lord has brought it about as a discipline or punishment. The Apostle Paul cited that uh, as why some in the church in Corinth had even died because they were abusing the observance of the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But there's a third observation uh, to be made about pain and suffering that it has occurred for reasons we can't know. Uh, but God does know, for he has brought it about uh, for his own glory, certainly, but possibly just for wonderful and joyous reasons that if we knew them would please us instead of disturb us. And so Jesus answered their question. It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And you know from that wonderful chapter, the works of God were displayed in that man born blind. So here was the occasion behind that occasion. The reason the blind man was born in this condition was so that God could display his glory and accomplish his perfect will in him. Now that was the case with the man born blind. Uh, but Jesus does not go there in this instance, for he has another angle from which to approach it. See, he can approach these issues from m several different angles. He's uh, God, very God of very God. So he approaches this from another angle. He asks them in verse 2, uh, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? And again, in verse 4, or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? This was the beginning of Jesus' rebuttal to the misconceived but popular idea that the two tragedies were due to the comparative sinfulness of the victims. Uh, he knew the tendency of people to feel that subtle sense of superiority tug at their minds as they pondered their own obvious goodness and moral superiority which had spared them a similar fate. Why do bad things happen uh, to good people? Well. The question itself is a faulty uh, question. Uh, in the pure and infinite holiness of the eyes of God, no person is good, but all are stained by the dark blemishes of sin. They, they have all run up a mountain of malicious debt on account of their waywardness and rebellion, and they have nothing with which they can repay it. Sin and debt are the burden of all men now, I want you to notice the, the carefully chosen uh, near synonyms Jesus used here. In verse 2, do you suppose the Galileans were worse sinners? Uh, then in verse 4, do you suppose the 18 were worse debtors? Now, the actual word he used translated uh, culprits in, in my translation. He goes on to answer his own question in the following verses, but the immediate conclusion we draw is that Jesus took the universal sinfulness of man as a starting point. But now his answer is, is direct and urgent, and for emphasis, he repeats it uh, verbatim. I tell you no, but unless you repent, uh, you will all likewise perish. Okay, the question was, do you think these poor people were worse sinners than you. And the answer he gives, if you'll allow me my own paraphrase, the answer he gave was, no way. Some of you go in the Greek and are reading in the Greek, you see it. No way, 
I tell you, on the contrary, if you did not repent, all of you will perish just as they perish suddenly and without appeal. Without any kind of last plea, just as the rich man of Luke 16 experienced, remember? Uh, who died and was buried and is next seen in Hades, being in torment, the text says there in the 23rd verse of Luke chapter 16. And then somehow eyeing uh, the former poor man, uh, Lazarus, enjoying the pleasures of heaven in Abraham's bosom. And the rich man uh, cried out for mercy from Abraham for just one more opportunity now that he could see uh, the ultimate tragedy that had come upon him. But Abraham told him in so many words, you had your chance. You had your chance. When death comes, we will all perish unless we have repented. It's the same word used in John 3, 16. God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. The reference is to the last judgment when everyone who has not repented and trusted in Christ will face the terrible judgment of God. Belief and repentance. We often say those are two sides of the same coin. One, repentance points to the, the response to our sin. The other, faith to our response to Jesus Christ. You know what repentance means? I know I do this all the time. You know. You know. It's because I look out and I know you know. Uh, you've been coming here a long time. You've been uh, studying your Bibles for a long time. You've been hearing the Bible taught for a long time. So Forgive me, but you know what repentance means. It means to stop your sinful ways and turn and go the other way. And you know what faith is, too. It's to know the truth about Jesus as God's Son and Savior, to assent to that truth, acknowledge that you believe it's true also, and then to depend on it solely for your deliverance from sin and the consequences of your sin. And that Jesus repeated it twice communicates the critical need for repentance. The unrepentant sinners in Jesus' hearing would meet up with unrepentant death in due course if they did not reverse, reverse course and sin. If perhaps there is someone listening now uh, who has not undergone that U-turn in life in which you give up your insatiable pursuit of the pleasures of this world and of self and you turn from your captivity to sin and evil and embrace instead the love and forgiveness found in the righteousness of Jesus and his atoning death on the cross. This very moment is the opportune time for you. It is your chance. As Jesus said, unless you repent, you will perish the same way. Well, it should not surprise us now, I said it during the Bible scripture reading, uh, to read on and find the Lord uh, following this up with a parable. Uh, William Hendrickson wrote that if the central lesson of verses 1 through 5 is be converted, that was Hendrickson's translation. Those terms can be interchangeable, repent, be converted. So he said, if the central lesson of verses 1 through 5 is be converted, then that of verses 6 through 9 is be converted now. Uh, do not delay. That is, if the Lord's first words emphasize the importance of repenting, this next session stresses that the opportunity will not be there forever. So to underscore what he has just said, Luke now tells us Jesus began to relate a parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, uh, Behold, for three years 
I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. And by the way, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the tree was only uh, three years old, only that it had, it had been fruitless for three years. It wouldn't have been unusual for a young tree to not bear fruit for a period of time. But then the owner said, cut it down. Uh, why does it even use up the ground? Uh, and the vineyard keeper answered and said to him, let it alone, sir, and, and for this year too, until I dig around it and, and put in fertilizer. And if it uh, bears fruit next year, fine. Uh, but if not, cut it down. Well, there are several things uh, we should establish at the start if we're to understand the parable. Uh, first, the fig tree represents or is emblematic of uh, Israel. Uh, the prophets often drew that comparison. See, for example, Jeremiah 24, verses 1 through 10, uh, Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. Uh, therefore, those who were then listening to Jesus were to understand he was directing the parable toward them. Secondly, the owner of the vineyard represents Israel's God. And thirdly, the keeper of the vineyard in the parable uh, must stand for Christ. And though they appear here representing two approaches they're actually working in harmony. Uh, one, arguing the merits of what is expected. The other, the hope for evidence of ultimate fruitfulness. So the story begins uh, with a, a man who owned a vineyard uh, planting a, a fig tree in it. It would not, it would not have been unusual uh, to plant a tree in a, a, um, in a vineyard. Uh, the vineyard was the place where the owner had cultivated the soil, uh, preparing the land to be fruitful because nutrients were there and, and conditions were ideal. And this is how God had dealt uh, with the Jews as a, a race. Uh, this picture is seen in Isaiah chapter 5, the first few verses. God is, in, in Isaiah chapter 5, God is singing a song. It's a beautiful picture. Uh, for his well-beloved, he calls them. Uh, he had a vineyard for his well-beloved in a fertile hill. He dug it all around. He removed the stones uh, and planted it with the choicest vine. And then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. So we see the fig tree of Jesus' parable had not been casually or dismissively planted in uh, some random place without advantage, but in a place giving it the best of opportunities to be fruitful. So I, I sometimes think about uh, the lives of my own life and the lives of, of friends. Uh, God planted us in a place that couldn't have been better. Uh, it was a place designed to be uh, fruitful. And, and this is what God had done with Israel. But for three years, uh, the owner of the vineyard had been coming up to the tree. The, ten, the sense of the verb is he kept coming. Uh, he, he, he kept coming up to the tree looking uh, for fruit, uh, considering the care uh, he had taken. It was not unreasonable for him to expect the tree to produce what it by nature ought to have produced. But his expectations were continually disappointed. He had exercised a patience. Uh, one can imagine him uh, walking out to inspect the tree from time to time. Uh, the fruit of a fig tree, my wife and I have one in, in the side yard of our house so we know uh, it, though it's a, a gnarly, uh, wretched specimen of a fig tree. But the fruit is not readily conspicuous from a distance. You must get in close to see it among the foliage of the tree. And this is what the owner of the vineyard had been doing for three years, frustrated every time, no, no fruit. And now his patience seems to have been exhausted. He, he makes known his complaint to the vine dresser and issues the verdict, cut it down. 
Why does it even use up the ground? What that means is like a grape vine, uh, the fig tree uh, was useful for only one thing, its fruit. Just like the grapevine, useful for one thing, its fruit. Its wood uh, was worthless except to be burned, and it wasn't very good at burning. So if it was not bearing fruit, it was worse than useless, for it continued to draw out moisture and nutrients from the soil that might have better been distributed to a plant or tree uh, bearing a useful uh, crop. <clears throat> its limbs uh, shielded uh, surrounding plants from the beneficial light of the sun. It was worse than useless. It was harmful. C.K. Lang uh, drew an apt spiritual application for the real targets of Jesus' parable. He wrote, an unfruitful life is hurtful to its surroundings upon which each of us should solemnly reflect. You may think that your spiritual regression and lawless and negligent conduct, your disinterest in spiritual things uh, concerns only yourself, but you're wrong. You are wrong about that. It positively harms those in your company. You're dragging them down with you. And therefore, <clears throat> it was only common sense uh, to, to cut the tree down. But it's at this point that in verse 8, uh, the person known as the vine, vineyard keeper, or al alternatively, the vine dresser, intervenes. Uh, this gardener was in the vineyard laboring, and he determined uh, to beg one more degree of patience from the owner while he attended to the wayward tree in his own special ways. One more year is all uh, he would ask, and we must believe that the vineyard owner agreed to his request as uh, the ancient, old, not ancient, the old commentator Edersheim uh, put it, between the tree and the ax, nothing intervenes but the intercession of the gardener who would make a last effort for a short and definite uh, period. He describes to the owner in verse 8 what his plan was. You can see there, uh, simply put, he would dig around it and put in uh, fertilizer. We can understand that on the very material, you know, dirt in your fingernails uh, way. Uh, when a plant or tree uh, is not thriving, we may resort to breaking up the soil around its roots in order to expose it more productively to the beneficial effects of, of the rain, for example. Additionally, we may spread fertilizer around it. In this case, the word is literally something like dung or manure in order to enrich the soil around it and feed it. That all makes sense on a, a natural level, but how does that translate in its allegorical sense? This is a parable. Uh, here, after all, uh, deeper down is a heavenly conversation going on between father and, and son. John Bunyan, uh, quite the allegorist himself, attempted to recreate this scene in one of his sermons. Uh, to Bunyan, uh, the vine dresser's design to dig around the tree give us, gives us an indication that its root structure was perhaps uh, earthbound, Bunyan said. And so he addresses the tree, barren fig tree. Uh, see how the Lord Jesus, by these very words, suggesteth the cause of thy fruitless soul. The things of this world lie too close to thy heart. Uh, the earth with, it, with its things has bound up thy roots, and thou art an earthbound soul. And then Bunyan has Jesus, the vine dresser, address the owner, the father. Uh, Lord, I will loosen his roots, I will dig up this earth. I will lay his roots bare. My hand shall be upon him in sickness, by disappointments, by cross providences, 
I will dig about him until he stands shaking and tottering until, until he be ready to fall. It's here that Bunyan's words remind me of the petition Dr. Johnson would often make as he closed in prayer, Lord, let them have no rest nor peace till they find it in me, in thee. But then Bunyan uh, goes on to explain, in this way, I say, deals the Lord Jesus oft times with the barren professor. He diggeth about him. He smiteth one blow at his heart, another blow at his lusts, a third at his pleasures, a fourth at his comforts, another at his self-conceitedness. In this way, he diggeth about him. This is the way to take bad earth from the roots and to loosen his roots from the earth. Barren fig tree, see here the care, the love, the labor, and way which the Lord Jesus, the dresser of the vineyard, is fair to take with thee, if haply thou mayest be made fruitful. Well, we've seen that uh, often, haven't we? With friends, family, perhaps with ourselves. We often wonder, don't we, uh, what the Lord is uh, doing or why he is doing uh, certain miserable things in the lives of professing uh, Christians. Uh, not always, certainly, but surely often, uh, the Lord is doing the heavenly work of dressing the vines of their lives in order to bring them to fruit while there is still time. It is the marvelous patience and mercy of God that is often in view when we observe uh, lives upended, uh, daily life made toilsome, possessions taken away, uh, all earthly support vanished, and one is left seemingly with nothing to lean upon. Perhaps in all the trials and difficulties, the Lord is offering one last opportunity to repent before it's too late. Jesus is the divine vine dresser, and he says, unless you repent, you will surely perish. So we must ask to those who are listening, have you repented and yielded yourself in faith to Jesus is their fruit uh, to show for it. As Jesus made his way through the regions of Galilee and Judah, he could not have made the plea more urgently. He continues uh, steadfastly today, doesn't he? As Peter reminded us in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness but is patient uh, toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Let me close this in prayer. Father, thank you for the gift uh, that is repentance. Um, I did not mention that in the lesson, but uh, everything that we have uh, that brings us the mercies of salvation and forgiveness is your gift. It's by grace that we've been saved. So uh, we hear here the call to repent, uh, the call to believe, the call to give evidence uh, that we have by the fruit that we bear. And just as with that repentance, just as with that belief that is given to us as a gift, we know that our good works, our fruit is, uh, are your gift as well. We pray for that. We pray for the lost, uh, Lord. There may not be a, a, a person in here who is lost, but uh, they're out there. And uh, they're in our families, perhaps. And so we pray for them uh, that during this distinct period uh, in which your patience is exercised, that you will draw them uh, to you in repentance and faith. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.